Good morning, Connection Church. Today we continue our sermon series, The Ups and Downs of Obeying God, by looking at the story of Elijah, where he is, um, he, he's just been fed by a widow for so long, and then her son, her one and only son, dies. So we're going to see how uh, the power of prayer changed not only Elijah's life, but also the lives of those that he literally touched with his ministry. So today I want to encourage you in your prayer life that God has power in your prayers. So if you would just get excited and I hope that you hear a a word from the Lord, especially for you today, because God is so into ministering to you as an individual in the church global, in the world globally, that he can speak to all of us at the same time and let us know exactly what it is that we need to know. So I'm going to kick us off with a word of prayer and then I'll be back in just a moment with today's message. Will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for a day to worship you, to proclaim that you are victorious and you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And I pray that the prayers of your people would be heard and we would see powerful results as a result of us coming to you with everything, no matter what's going on in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, it is good to uh, be able to... It, It is weird... Like when we, like for me, there's this adjustment phase I'm going through without the masks. Like it feels, it feels weird to me. And so I just want to encourage you. Uh, it, it's probably supposed to feel, feel weird at this moment. We've gone through a little bit of a, a little bit of a, we've gone through a worldwide pandemic and we're still not totally through the other side of it for sure. But uh, we're seeing significant progress here. And uh, I want to encourage you that uh, um, it, it's, it's okay if you're a little nervous. But as we were singing, I was like, man, you know, the Spirit of God is the, is, is, the Greek word, I think, is, is pneuma, and it's, it's wind. And so the, it's the breath of God. And so as, as our, you know, that's been a scary, th- breath's been a scary thing for us, right? Like, breathe on us, Lord. Um, and so I believe the Lord is bringing healing to us um, through vaccines and other ways, too. But also, I believe God wants to bring healing to us through His Holy Spirit, to breathe on us and to move us in the direction to be more like Him. So I would love to... Uh, just uh, celebrate with you the chance we have to, to see each other's faces again and just feel a little awkward about it. <laughs> Is this okay? Can I see your face? <laughs> All right, cool. So we're going to continue our worships, uh, our series today. And we're talking about praying with power. I want you to pray with power. How many times do you pray and you feel like it's not really affecting much? This isn't really going to do much. Or, or you go to someone and you say, well, the, the only thing I can really do is pray for you. And, and so there's sometimes I think we downsize what prayer actually is. And, and maybe it's because we don't really understand what it is that we have here. So as we go through this story of Elijah, we're going through verse by verse in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to see how, um, how God has used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And while I think you're extraordinary for many ways, uh, it, it is good for us to realize that we are merely human. In that way, we're ordinary. We're, we're, the cross reminds us that we're not better than other people, and we're not less than other people. That God glories in who we are, but we are, in fact, humans. And so God wants to use us as hum- humans to do His work in the world. And prayer is probably the most powerful, it's like probably out. It's the most powerful, powerful weapon that we have as children of God, is prayer. It's not a last resort. And so we're going to uh, remind you too, uh, I know I forgot to mention this, there are worship handouts over there. If you want to go grab one, you're not going to bother anyone. You can fill in some blanks in a few minutes. You can grab one of those and, and a pen as well while I'm talking. Don't worry, it's fine. Um, and so 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24 is where we'll get started. So I just want to jump in here and let's listen to this story because we're going to see how Remember Elijah, he, was, uh, he came out of the gate and he just went to the king's palace and he did this miraculous thing and told the king, it's not going to rain until I say so. And then immediately after that, this bold proclamation of God doing this uh, powerful work to this king that he is probably afraid of for good reason, he goes away to Kareth. And Kareth is this place of, of, of being humble and being broken. 
And then he goes next after that, he was fed by ravens there and, and, and by a brook. And then the brook finally dried up. And last week, Austin shared with us how he, he went on this next trek of the journey. And it wasn't that much better. He went to a, a, a widow and her son were there. And she had only some little flour and some little oil. And he was like, feed me. <laughs> and she was like, I don't have enough. He's like, feed me first. And then you'll have plenty left over. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But it came across that way, I'm sure, to her. And, and she obeyed and she did what God told them to do and God provided miraculously. It was fantastic. It was amazing. But then something else happens. A tragedy hits. And we see that today when uh, tragedy uh, enters the scene. Sometime later, the son of the... So that's where they are. He's um, uh, being fed by the widow and her son is there too. She, the son is the only person she has left, Okay. And um, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. So the son's sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing, so he dies. She says to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? And Elijah says, Give me your son. So he took him from her arms, and he carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid the son on Elijah's bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house, and he, he gave him to his mother, and he says, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. We learned last week, Zarephath, Zarephath is where uh, the second stop on Elijah's journey, and this is where he, he was during this time. And Zarephath, Zarephath means to, to melt down or to refine. And it's not an enjoyable process. It's painful. And we, you know, we, we talked about that last week here, that it's a, the refinement that God does in us. And in, in our obedience, we are being refined to become more like Him. And in that refinement, nothing really gets our attention more than pain. Like when it hurts, you're like, oh snap, this is all I can think about. If you, just your own body, if there's just one part of your body that's hurting, it consumes your thoughts. It gets your attention. And so pain grabs our attention. And this time, we see that pain is the sting of death. But God is going to prove, once again, to Elijah and to other people, that nothing is impossible for God. In fact, it goes back to Jeremiah 32, 17. Uh, he says here, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. And he says, Nothing is too hard for you. And then God responds later on. He says, I am the Lord, the God of mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And the answer is, is no, it's not. Another time uh, we, we see here in, in Jeremiah, one of the things that we see here is that when God is part of the equation, nothing is impossible. But we also know that apart from God, we're nothing. When we're disconnected from Him, we think of the Jesus, of the, I am the vine, you are the branches. If we're not connected with Him, if we're not with Him, then we're, we're, we're nothing. That's why we at Connection Church say we're connecting people to Jesus and one another. That's our mission. Because if we're not connecting people to Jesus, then we're not being a church. He goes on, uh, Luke, excuse me, in Luke we see Jesus say this about... Um, what is impossible with God. And Jesus looked at uh, this man and he said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? He said, indeed, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they asked a superbly appropriate question. And that question is this, well, who can be saved then? If it's impossible, then who, who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is what? Is possible with God. And again, this is where we sometimes we take God out of the equation. And maybe that's why our prayer lives stink. Maybe that's why we're struggling in that because we, we're putting the impetus on my righteousness or my power or my right words or me being in a right place with God instead of putting it on Jesus and saying it's by your power that these things can happen. Not by mine. 
According to this passage, we're reminded that only God can save us. And the good news is, spoiler alert, He's done what He needs to do to save us. But it's only by His power. But God does invite us to be part of His journey. So it's not like, okay, God, we're putting it all on you now, and we don't have to do anything. No, there is a part that God has for us to do. In Romans chapter 10, we see uh, some of this happening. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's kind of the impossible, becoming possible. So God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved because of what Jesus has done. And then Romans chapter 10, verse 14, the next verse says this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them. Now, sometimes we hear that word preaching, or we see it or read it, uh, and we think that means what I'm doing right now, which is preaching uh, as a preacher. Uh, But it doesn't mean that people only hear the Word of God by going to church and hearing a sermon. That's not at all what this means. Preaching is a proclamation is what it is. And so we are all called to be preachers to proclaim what Christ has done. That's, That's what we are called to do. We're ministers of the gospel. So we are to be the ones proclaiming it's it, it, good news. News is not something that you have to defend. News is something, I mean, obviously when you report something in the news, you should be able to have facts on it. But what I mean by is the good news is something that we proclaim, that we just tell others about. We announce it. And so how can they do this without someone hearing it? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So check this out. God invites us into to be part of the equation, to be part of his mission of reaching others, and we are privileged to be invited to help bring faith to other people. When we proclaim the good news of Jesus, it ignites something. And the Holy Spirit goes to work and He draws them out and gives them faith. Faith is a gift from God. God is going to use Elijah's prayers to bring life in a place where death was ruling. And God is also inviting us for our prayers to be used. To have powerful prayers in our lives. To where people can be changed and they can be brought to life out of death. So what are some lessons God's teaching us in the matters of life and death? Because today we're talking about tragedy. When tragedy enters, when the worst things happen, how do we respond? So let's go back to 1 Kings 17, 17 and and just look here. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally he stopped breathing. So everything was going to according to God's plan. Elijah was faithful. The mother was faithful. Let's assume the son was somewhat faithful, but he was a son. He probably rebelled a little bit, but let's say he was faithful too. He was a good son. Everything's going according to plan. And now the only thing of value, the only thing of worth, the only thing of consequence to this woman's life is gone. All she did was be obedient to the Lord. How is that fair? One of the things that we must remember as we go through life is that death is a result of the fall. It wasn't part of God's plan. It wasn't his original... It wasn't an original ingredient in creation process. It was a result of our rebellion. So all of us are going to deal with death in some way as a consequence of that fall. And God's will is... Sometimes it's not even going to... We can be in the center of God's will and still have to go through tragedy, is what I'm trying to say. It's not like protecting us from tragedy. Tragedy is going to happen. But when things are going well for us, when we're on a mountaintop with God, when we're obedient, when we're doing what He tells us to do and tragedy hits, it can catch us off guard. And it can really rock our worlds. God, how could you let this happen? I'm trying to do everything right. I'm giving, I'm serving, I'm doing these things. What the heck? And that's the G-rated version. I mean, you can just really be rocked by 
tragedy when it hits your life. And so we see this happen with the, with the widow. She says to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? And we, this man of God is most likely sarcastic. Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? So the first thing on your, we see her natural reaction. And so the first thing on the worship or your outline is this. Our normal reaction to tragedy, and we see this here, is that the first one is to blame someone. To blame someone. That's what she did. She says, Elijah, it's your fault. Did, did you do this? Well, what are you doing, man of God? Why did you even come here? Now my son's dead? So it's typical for us to look out and find someone to blame. The second one is this. We blame ourselves. I must have done something wrong. She says, we think God is punish, punish, punishing us for the sins of our past. She says, did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? It must have been something I've done in the past that God's punishing me for. We see Job's friends in the Old Testament that, that said this, like, bro, you must have done something really wrong. You need to just... You're getting what you deserve. And you can see principles of that in, in Exodus chapter 20, I think, where it, it talks about that. Chapter 20, verse 5, I think. Uh, and so there's these principles sometimes, and we can take those principles of something that happened at a certain time, and we can put it over to us, and we try to make it fit to us when it really doesn't. And so we start to blame other people. We start to blame ourselves. And then finally, we can blame God. You man of God. God, God did this. O oh, man of God, is what she says. <clears throat> Tragedy did not come from God. It didn't come from Him. The blame for our tragedy is, is the sinful nature of humanity, the ultimate sin that, that broke our world, humanity's choice to rebel against God. And so this, this widow quickly, you see, she was caught off guard. And it's understandable. I'm not judging her. One day we're going to be in heaven with her, so definitely I don't want her to think I'm judging her. It, she was caught off guard. She was doing everything right, and she got rocked. And she quickly forgot how faithful God was to her. All the previous times, she was, he was miraculously making this flour and oil replenish. So she's caught off guard. She's just kind of raw in the, in the moment. And so now Elijah has to minister to her. How does he respond to her? What, is, what does he need to do? A grieving widow. How do you help someone who's depressed? How do you minister to someone who's suffering in the moment? How do you minister to someone who's just lost a loved one that's so precious to them? Here's what Elijah did. He, he said, oh, excuse me. He said, give me your son, Elijah replied. And so he took he took him from her arms and he carried her up to the upper room where he was staying and he laid him on the bed and then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought this tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by, by causing her son to die? And, and then he, he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord God, let this boy's life return to him. That's what he did. And so I, the question is, I mean, that, that's, this is a powerful thing, so it's, it's kind of not easy to to say, what are we supposed to do in these moments? Because this is a quite miraculous act that's happening. But how do we help people who are hurting? How do we help the hurting? Uh, the first one is, is don't lecture them. What if Elijah had said, now listen here. What you need to do is have faith in God in this moment and just quit all this mumbo jumbo. She doesn't need to hear that right now. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. Sometimes what you need to say or what you can say to someone that's truth isn't the right time for it. And so in the moment people are hurting, they need you to be with them. When Jesus, or, or Paul wrote, weep with those who weep. Not preach to those who weep. When people who are weeping, you know, you don't say, it's going to be fine. No, don't say that. Weep with them. Be with them where they are. Connect with them emotionally. Don't lecture them. He didn't start preaching. She needed something besides a word. She needed compassion. And that's what she received. The second thing is that reach out to them and bear their burdens. So you, you reach out to them and you join with them in their burdens. You meet them where they are. Get involved in their life. You have to be, be careful with this too. You don't want to get involved in their life at a, at a level that's too far beyond what they're wanting or needing in that moment. And so you want to reach out to them and bear their burdens and meet them where they are. And the third one is the most important, I think. Take it to the prayer room. 
Don't ever say, well, but all I can do is pray about it. Scratch that from your vocabulary. Boldly say, I'm going to be praying for you about this. I will be praying for this. I will be praying for your son. I will be praying for this issue in your life. Your public prayer, which means your prayer with other people, will correlate with your private prayer. So if you're dry in your private prayer, guess what's going to happen with your prayer with others? It'll be dry. But if you have a rich prayer life privately, that's going to translate over and give you more boldness when you are around other people to, to pray for them. It's going to give you more boldness. So Elijah's prayers were powerful. And so we see this principle in life when it comes to prayer. And it's on your outline as well. Well, uh, prayer is meant to be our first resort. Prayer is meant to be our first resort. And what I mean by that is immediately when she says, and you know, if it was sarcastic, we don't really read tone. It's kind of like reading a text message <laughs> when you read scripture sometimes. Like, does she have attitude with this? Or was it just like, you know, was she being serious? I, I don't know. Yeah, so we don't really know for sure. But if you read it with, you know, sometimes I would have attitude about it. Uh, oh, man of God. That's probably what I read into it because that's what I would do. Um, but if that's the case, then I feel like I might get a little defensive in that moment. Like, don't be blaming me. I didn't want to come here. God told me to come here, too. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. You think I wanted to be here? And so, but that's not what Elijah did. Elijah had prayers as his first resort. He said, immediately he took the boy to his room to pray. It was the first resort. The first thing on his mind was to pray. And in that prayer, we are to be transparent. Transparent. He goes and he questions God. He's like, uh, have you done this? Have you brought tragedy to this widow? He was transparent. He's like, this is, this is what I'm feeling. Which goes along with this right here too. The next one, we are to be transparent and personal. Like, God, this is affecting me. This is, you know, th I've come here to, to help this widow and you, you've brought me here. Are you really doing this? You know, being personal doesn't, you know, with God means speaking to Him in the way that we would maybe speak with one another. Not disrespectfully. I don't mean like the bad stuff, but at the same time, if you're feeling disrespect toward God, where do you think you need to go to deal with that? You need to go to Him. Take it to Him. He's a big boy, right? He, he can handle it. He understands. It, it, just think about the cross when they were mocking Jesus and just saying the most vile of things. I, I don't imagine you ever doing that in your life. And maybe you have. Maybe you've been to the part where you just kind of hated God and, and now you're, you're different or maybe you're still struggling with some of these things but just look at what Jesus' words he said Father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing so God is a God of strength and compassion so be personal with him which also is being honest with God is the, the next one here we're to be honest with God God I don't know what you're doing here I'm staying with her. I know her. I don't know what you're doing here. I'm just being honest with you. This, this stinks. And the last two are this. To be open with God. Our prayer life is that we are to be open with God. To, to not hide anything. To air our emotions, our feelings, our doubt. To be open. And the last one is to be candid. You know, if, if you have a friend who, are these, who have these qualities... I think you probably appreciate that friend if they're not a jerk about it, right? If they're humble about it, if they'll be honest with you, like this morning I put on a different shirt and, you know, I asked Carrie, I, it felt really tight on, on my belly. And I said, does this, you know, is this, is this too tight? And she goes, it's a little snug, you know? And I said, yeah, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. And so uh, it was very nice. But she, she'll tell me, like, if, if I need to change clothes. Uh, and so I, I like that. And she's not a jerk about it, though. So I appreciate that honesty and the openness and the candidness to say, you should change your shirt, you know. Uh, and so uh, I did. And I appreciate that because it was way too tight. <laughs> the prayer life of Elijah w was all of these things. He, he did these things. In that one verse, we see this. And we see a powerful result. Listen to what happened. Or you can read with it here too. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. Now his prayer is called a cry here. It doesn't say prayer, but like it was a pleading with God. That's that open, honest, kind of raw emotions, just letting it out there. This, this visceral response and, and communication with God. He heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him. And the boy lived. And Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. 
and he gave him to his mother and he says, Booyah! Who's the man of God now? No, he didn't say that, did he? Because he was full of the Spirit of God. He says, look, it's not about what I've done. It's not about how great I am. It's not about proving you wrong. Your son's alive. Can you imagine the joy in his heart and the, the, just the joy in that mother's heart to have her only son returned? We see powerful results of prayer. And the final thing here is that the powerful results of prayer are this in your life too, that God hears the prayers of His people. God hears your prayers. Just like He heard Elijah's. He hears your cries to Him. He hears your, you pouring your heart out to Him. He hears you questioning Him. He hears them. Sometimes my kids will try to talk to me and I don't hear them. Because I'm busy with something else. Our Father in Heaven doesn't have that problem. He hears them. He's paying attention. You are not bothering Him. You do not frustrate God when you go to Him all the time. Sometimes, let's just be honest, people start talking to us, you're like, really? Do I have to listen more? You know, I feel that way. I know none of you do, but I do. So, but that's, anyway, God doesn't feel that way. He doesn't get frustrated. He delights in the, us praying to Him, coming to Him all the time. He hears the prayers of His people. And finally, our prayers bring life. All I, can, I'll just, all I can do is pray. No, never say that again unless you're saying it the way I just said it. Only tell people not to say it by saying it, okay? So, I get to pray for you. My prayers will bring life into this situation. That's not a boastful thing. It's not like my prayers are awesome. It's that the God that I'm praying to is. That's why my prayers bring life. They bring life. Life, And we see this in chapter 17, verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. So in verse 1 of this entire chapter, we see Elijah come out of the gate, and he's known as Elijah the Tishbite. And nobody knows where Tishba is. It's this small place from nowhere. We know the general region today, but it's kind of it's gone away. It was such a small, inconsequential uh, um place that it's, it's not there anymore. He was a nobody from nowhere going to the king and now he's being called what? Man of God. He's walking by faith. He's living by faith. He's obedient to the Lord. So how will you respond when your trials come? What will be your response when tragedy interrupts your life, when these difficult lives just barge in? There was a great tragedy that's greater than any tragedy we will ever endure. The greatest tragedy was when the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord Jesus, the one who came to save the world, was crucified and killed. All of his followers lost hope. But God did the impossible. God became man. He became like us. He died, and then he rose again, conquering sin and death. He did what only he could do, but his resurrection was still hard to believe because of the great tragedy that was seen. It was even hard to believe for some of his closest followers, and Thomas was one of those followers, and he, he came uh, on the scene after people had heard, hey, Jesus is back from the dead. And he's like, bro, that's not true. There's no way that's happening because that doesn't happen. And so Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus showed up on the scene when he came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And he said to them, hey, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. But a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And through the, oh, excuse me, though the doors were closed, they were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he says, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, he turns to Thomas because he, he, knew, he knew what Thomas was. He knew what's going on. And he says, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And Thomas' response here is a great prayer for all of us. Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. I believe. You are my Lord. Like you, you own me. I belong to you. And you are my God. And then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Thomas is not doubting Thomas anymore. I actually don't like that phrase. Uh, my middle name's Thomas, so I take it personal. But it, doubting Thomas, he's not doubting Thomas anymore. That was a moment in his life. He is not doubting Thomas anymore. He is Thomas, man of God. He's believing Thomas. He's pillar of the church, Thomas. He's take the good news to Jesus, to the na other nations, Thomas. He's man of God. And so when you trust Jesus yourself, you pray with power. You're consistently turning your heart to God. You're not a nobody from nowhere. You are a woman of God. You are a man of God. It's not where you're from that determines who you are. But it's where Jesus has gone for you. He's gone to the cross. He's gone to the tomb. And He conquered it all for you. So Jesus is stronger than any tragedy you will ever face. And I'm not making light of tragedies. They're big. But in this moment, I will remind all of us that He is stronger than any tragedy we will ever face. And so I want you to rest on this. Rest on the fact that He is stronger. And when you rest on that, you will pray with power. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we proclaim that you are uh, alive, that you are well, that you are reigning supreme, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We proclaim that you faced the greatest tragedy on the cross, that you died for our sins, and that on the third day you rose victoriously. It was so shocking to even those who were, who were with you. And today, Lord, though we didn't see you face to face, while we didn't put our hands in your side, while we didn't touch your, your scars, Lord, we, we say that we believe. And Lord, we ask for even more belief, that you would give us an increase of our faith. You would cause us to, to be stirred by who you are, knowing that when we trust in you, Lord, that we've, we've been taken from death to life, from darkness to light. Lord, I pray that um, this week, especially, and honestly for the rest of our lives, but at least this week, Lord, I pray that you would remind us how powerful it is for us to, to pray, to spend time with you and to pour our hearts out and to bring our requests to you and just spend time worshiping you. Because when we do that, Lord, you change who we are. Instead of trying to be part of the world system where we point fingers and we, we just say, if they weren't here, if they would change, if these things were, were different, then we would have a better place. Lord, what we acknowledge is that we need to be changed. That our hearts need to be filled with your spirit. That there's no room for pride. Or I just love how Elijah didn't come down with boastfulness after this great miracle. He didn't take credit for it like like he did with the king in the beginning, like it's not going to rain except by my word. He came down and just simply laid this boy, uh, gave this boy to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. There's no boastfulness there, Lord. So the only thing we boast in today is the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And we thank you for being powerful in Jesus' name. Amen. So today as we go to the Lord's table, uh, every week we do communion. Uh, it's on the table back here. There's uh, bread and there's a cup uh, with wine as well. So you'll take a piece of bread and be reminded this is Christ's body broken for you. Remember the tragedy of the cross, that his body was literally broken for you. And then we also have the cup, which is the blood of Christ. And that is a sign of a new covenant, a covenant that will never be taken away. It is sealed by the blood of Christ. So we go to the table and we, we, we eat and we drink and all of the glory goes to Jesus. And when we are turned to Jesus, remember, our prayers are going to the one who did that for us. So he has compassion for us, for sure. But he also has victory. We don't go to a, a cross anymore and lament that our Savior has died. We celebrate that our Savior lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let me pray for the table and then we'll go. Oh, we'll just take turns of going to the table uh, for those of you who may be new. Lord, we love you. We bless you. And as we spend time coming to this table during this song, 
Uh, we, we partake of what you've done for us. Christianity is not about what we do for you. We don't come to the table with boastfulness. We don't come to the table because we had a good week. We don't come to the table because of anything we've done. We come to the table because we proclaim we need you, Jesus, and we receive what you have done for us. So, Lord, we bless you. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So every week we close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.